Hello, my name is Tariq Adar. Today I'm going to be talking about post-fertilization embryology, focusing on the formation of the blastocyst, gastrulation, and trophoblastic development. So as a disclaimer, this isn't an official product of any medical school or program. Um, this was created by me as part of my hobbies. I am asking professors to review my slides. Um, I am sending the recordings. Um, for verification of the content, but there is no endorsement of this material. And while the material might overlap with things taught in your curriculum, it's by no means a replacement. I'm not a licensed physician. I don't have doctoral training. All the images, unless otherwise cited, are coming from Langman's Medical Embryology, 14th edition. And so there's just a few things I want to point out on the slide before we get started. Um, I want to do some definitions. Blasts are cells that give rise to something. So the embryo blast is made by the cells that give rise to the embryo. And the trophoblast is composed of cells that give rise to the feeding, trophos. And those are going to become the villi. So you can see why they're feeding cells, trophoblasts. These are going to give rise to the villi, and the embryo blasts are going to give rise to the embryo. Now the cells are held together by adherence junctions. And this is important because there's a very important protein called E cadherin. E, so the way I remember it, is E cadherin keeps cells here. So if you have one cell like this, one cell like this, and one cell like this, they're held together by these adherence junctions. And if E cadherin is mutated, like what happens in cancer, they're no longer held together. And this cell, if it's a tumor, is free to invade and go somewhere else. So that's pretty high yield. You want to know that, that mutations, cancer cells will have mutations in E cadherin, which is supposed to keep, E keeps the cell here, E cadherin. All right, so keep that in mind. I also want to point out that this is called a blastocyst cavity, but another phrase for it is blastocele. And anytime you have a cyst or, a, or anything that can like fill with fluid, it's seal is the suffix. So blastocyst, blastocyl. If it happens in the epididymis, so um, that's where sperm is stored until time for delivery, it's going to be called a spermatocele. That cyst is called a spermatocele. All right, and it can be spelled like this or it can be spelled like this. It's no big difference. All right. So the cells, like I said, the cells of the inner cell mass give rise to the embryo. The cells of the outer cell mass give rise to the villi. Those are the trophoblasts. The trophoblasts are going to recognize the uterine stroma because they express a molecule called a selectin. Okay? So this, again, this is the inner cell mass, and then these are the trophoblasts surrounding it. So the trophoblasts are going to express selectin. And selectin recognizes glycoproteins on the endometrium. So the uterine epithelium is called the endometrium. And they express carbohydrate receptors. Those cells express carbohydrate receptors. And the selectin is specific to those carbohydrate receptors. So that's how the trophoblast recognizes where to go. The reason I'm mentioning this isn't because the examiner is going to ask you, how does the trophoblast know where to go? It's because selectins are important for another process. And that's called white blood cell recruitment. I'm going to talk about it more on the next slide. But by the time the trophoblast attaches, we're going to, it's going to have been the first week of development. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because what examiners can say is a woman comes in and she gets a positive pregnancy test. And you, her last, we're going to say her last menstrual period was day zero. Okay. So examiners will say she comes in. Um, on this day, her last menstrual period was blah, blah, blah. Which processes in development have occurred? That's what they're going to ask. So always you take your last menstrual period as the baseline. And then fertilization happens at about the fourth. Remember, ovulation is day 14. So this happens around the 14-day mark. The egg is only viable for a few days. And if it's fertilized and it undergoes development, Blastocyst plus implantation has occurred by the end of that first week. So by 21 days, 
you will have a blast assist, blast assist, and the blast assist will have implanted. So examiners can say her last menstrual period was 24 days ago. What of the following happened? And everything. So she's the zygote has been fertilized. There's been cleavage. The blast assist has formed, and it's implanted. All right. Let's talk about white blood cell recruitment for a second. And here we have a selectin. But why is the selectin there? All right, this is the endothelial layer. All right, what I'm highlighting in red is the endothelial layer. This is the wall of the blood vessel. And the reason why selectins can be upregulated, or you'll have more of them, is when there's injury to the endothelium. So let me use purple for that. So let's say this area here gets injured, the tissue gets angry. It's like, ow, something's happening. I'm calling the police, the immune system. And in order to do that, it upregulates selectins. Now you have more selectins in this region of that requires an immune response. And the white blood cells are just vibing. They're just floating along with their carbohydrate receptors. And the selectins will bind the carbohydrate receptors of the white blood cells. And what will happen is the white blood cell will roll along. It'll form these weak interactions with the selectin. And the same way how the trophoblast selectin allowed it to come close to the carbohydrate receptor on the, on the epithelium of the uterus, the selectin expressed by the endothelium is going to grab the white blood cells and slow them down and make them roll along the blood vessel so that they can get closer to where the site of injury is. All right? That's important. You have to know that. And that's called rolling. So selectins mediate rolling. And it's an analogous to how the trophoblast will sort of come to the vicinity or roll towards where it needs to go in the uh, uterine epithelium. Now, the oviduct looks something like this, right? So you have your ampulla over here. You have your ovary. It gets swept up, and then it's going to come into the uterus. All right, I'm just going to draw one hat, this side of it. Normally, we want to implant here. But what can happen is that you can implant either in the internal os of the cervix, which is bad, um, or very close to it. And we never want the placenta to bridge the cervix. If the placenta bridges the cervix, that can place the mother at risk of severe hemorrhage during the second trimester and during delivery. That's bad. Um, this can be an indication uh, for, for cesarean. Now, when it, implanting in the internal os is a form of ectopic pregnancy. So over here, we have all the different sites that an ectopic pregnancy can occur. Um, ignoring the figure for a moment, just paying attention to my laser pointer, the egg is going to come out and will be uptaken by the fimbrae. And the fimbrae are going to sweep the egg once it's been fertilized through this whole area until it implants, right? The egg is supposed to be released and then it'll get fertilized. It gets sweeped up. It gets fertilized at some point in here and then it's going to get implanted. Now, there's two points I want to repeat there. First of all, fertilization does not occur in the ovary. Fertilization First, the egg is going to get swept up by the fimbrae into the oviduct, and fertilization can occur at any point over here. And that raises another concern. If, let's say, um, you had pelvic inflammatory disease, and that causes stricture and scarring of the oviduct, it's harder for a fertilized egg to get through. So, in fact, it might implant here instead of in the endometrium. And that's the most common form of ectopic pregnancy. That's a medical emergency. Um, that is not that is not a viable pregnancy. Now, and that and despite what you may see on the news, you cannot, that is not salvageable. You can't take an ectopic pregnancy from the oviduct and put it in the uterus. Because as we explained earlier, the trophoblast and its selectin is gonna bind to the carbohydrate receptor on the uterus, 
And there's going to be a whole signaling cascade where there's going to be crosstalk between a bunch of different components. And if that cascade is, in, is interrupted, the embryo won't develop properly. So there's no scientific basis for re-implanting an ectopic pregnancy into the uterus. Um, we don't have the technology. There's not a lot of scientific rationale behind it. It's just not a viable pregnancy. Another place that an ectopic pregnancy can occur, so if it does occur in the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdominal cavity, if it's going to occur in the peritoneum, it's going to occur between the posterior wall of the uterus and vagina, and the anterior wall of the rectum. All right. So over here in this pouch called the, the rectal uterine pouch or the pouch of Douglas. All right. And the reason why this can happen is notice that you have fimbrae here that are supposed to take up an egg, right? Well, if the fimbrae don't take it up, it just sort of ploops out and can fall somewhere else within the peritoneum. The most common site of an abdominal ectopic pregnancy is the pouch of Douglas. I think I have an extra S there. The pouch of Douglas, the rectouterine pouch. A tubal ectopic pregnancy is the most common type of ectopic pregnancy overall. So let's talk a bit about pelvic inflammatory disease since I just brought it up. So as we said, the overduct is going to scar and get narrower. But how does that happen? There are two organisms, chlamydia and gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia trachomatis. Those are the two infections that can cause chronic bouts of repeated inflammation. Okay, and this repeated inflammation causes damage. Repeated inflammation causes damage, and that damage needs to be healed. And that's mediated by TGF beta. TGF beta is what promotes the healing process and the scarring process. All right, because sometimes when you heal, you have you have a scar. Sometimes you can restore the original tissue. Sometimes you can't, and it depends on the tissue type. But repeated so you get if a woman has one of these stds chlamydia or gonorrhea and you have these repeated scarrings of the tubes of the oviducts what happens is the egg gets stuck it doesn't actually get to the uterus and that can cause the ectopic pregnancy but again it's these stds that establish chronic repeated bouts of inflammation that in the to heal, they, have, they might have to scar over, and when they scar, it causes this issue. And pelvic inflammatory disease is painful. It's, it's, a, it's not a great, um, it's not the greatest condition to have um, because it affects, it also affects fertility. Um, it affects, it increases your risk of ectopic pregnancy. And, you know, this is really just an advertisement to counsel all your patients on proper condom use. And this is actually one of the risks you need to talk to them about because a lot of men are asymptomatic with gonorrhea. So a lot of them, one of the big culprits of transmission of gonorrhea are asymptomatic men, right? The men don't have the symptoms. They'll have intercourse with the woman and give the woman the gonorrhea. So just because the partner feels fine, and this is true for HIV, this is true for herpes, this is true for gonorrhea and chlamydia, um, there's a whole garden variety of STDs um, that can have, people don't really know that there's dire consequences, but this is an opportunity for you to be able to counsel patients on, pop, on proper protection. Um, because you tell the patient, look, if you get chlamydia and gonorrhea and you get this chronic um, inflammatory syndrome in your pelvis, it's going to hurt a lot. And not only that, you're going to have trouble with fertility if you want kids later, and you can have scarring and an ectopic pregnancy, and if it hemorrhages, it could kill you. So it's not a joke. So I just want to point out here, let's look at the cytotrophoblast. Let me use a laser pointer for clearer detail. So here's the cytotrophoblast. All right. Notice the regularity. They're not sharing. They are just cell trophoblasts. All right? They're individual cells. However, these are syncytiotrophoblasts. Syncytiotrophoblast together. 
cytop uh, cell slash cytoplasm, cells that give rise to feeding. So the syncytiotrophoblasts form a syncytium, which is a bunch of nuclei within shared cytoplasm. All right. So that's the syncytiotrophoblast, this dark green structure. And what it's going to do, it's going to eventually get these. I'm going to draw these in. It's going to form lacoons. So openings are going to form eventually. And it's going to erode. It's going to grow into these blood vessels and erode them. So, the, so it's going to lead to blood filling these lacoons. So these are going to get filled eventually when the syncytiotrophoblasts reach the maternal blood vessels. And that establishes uteroplacental circulation once that happens. All right? So over here, again, the same idea. Here you have, notice this pale cytoplasm with lots of different nuclei inside it, right? The syncytium. This is all syncytiotrophoblasts. All right? Notice there's multiple nuclei. Compare to, you can actually compare it to, this is the stromal cells of the endometrium. This is the endometrial stroma. These are mom cells. Notice how regular they are, right? Like, look at these. They're, they're very discrete cells, right? Very discrete cells. Very discrete, very discrete. All of these outside of this boundary are very discrete cells. And compare that to this. You see this eosin eosinophilic cytoplasm. Um, you see these nuclei. Right? There's multiple, they're scattered throughout it. Sorry, not eosinophilic cytoplasm, pale cytoplasm. And you see these nuclei just scattered inside it. And those are the syncytiotrophoblasts. And then here, you see the cytotrophoblasts. It's more, um, it's more, it looks more like what we saw on the previous slide, where the cells were neatly arranged. And here you have your hypoblast, and here you have an epiblast. This is the beginning of the amniotic cavity right here. And it's actually epiblast cells are forming this part. Okay, so the epiblast, the way it's going to divide, it's going to come this way. All right, it's going to form the amnion on top of it. So if this is our bilaminar disc, our epiblast and hypoblast, that's called the bilaminar disc. All right, and it's a hallmark of the second week of development. The second week of development, by the end of it, you have the bilaminar disc. And that's what we're looking at right now. Okay? If your amnion is here, if your epiblast is here, the amnion comes off of it up on top like this. The hypoblast is down here, and eventually the yolk sac is going to be hanging from the bottom. So you have epiblast and its amnion. It's going to proliferate to form a sac. The you're going to have the amnion. And down here, you're going to have the the yolk sac you'll have the hypoblast and the yolk sac all right so that's the epiblast and this over here is the hypoblast and you make you can make an argument that this might this might be the yolk sac but i'm not fully sure all right so i want you to pay attention to what's going on here focus only on the syncytiotrophoblast all right only on the dark green you have these lacuna over here these enlarged blood vessels and the syncytiotrophoblasts are going to grow into them. And they're going to grow into them and break down their endothelial lining, break down the lining of these blood maternal sinusoids so that they bleed into the lacuna. At the same time, the cytotrophoblasts are starting to grow in and push the syncytium around. They're starting to grow in. They're making these finger-like projections. They're growing. They're growing. And those are the villi. All right? Those are primary villi. That's what's going to generate the villi. And these this extra embryonic mesoderm, don't worry too much about it right now, not high yield, you don't need to be concerned with it. Just know that it's going to be involved in driving into the syncytiotrophoblast as well to make the villi. One thing I want to point out is how these blood vessels are prepared and how the, the endometrium is prepared for the embryo. So there's a proliferative phase and a, and a secretory phase. Actually, let me erase this because it looks like I'm labeling these two pictures and I'm not. So the first 14 days and the latter 14 days of the menstrual cycle where ovulation occurs at this point, induced by an LH surge and then you have FSH and all that stuff. But at the FSH comes at the beginning and it's a whole process. But we're not going to worry about that right now. 
What I want you to know right now is the first 14 days, we're talking only about the uterus, we're not concerned with the ovary right now. The first 14 days is defined by estrogen. And the latter 14 days is defined by progesterone's effect on the endometrium. Estrogen's effect on the endometrium is proliferation. Okay? Estrogen's effect on the endometrium is proliferation. And the reason why this is important is that estrogen is very pro-growth. And it acts strongly on the endometrium. It acts on other organs as well. And because it's pro-growth, if you supply estrogen um, supplementally, you can be putting the patient at risk for cancer. So taking a family history is really important because let's say somebody has a family history of estrogen responsive breast cancer. If you're going to put them on estrogen, which is a growth factor, and they have a family history of developing cancer that was estrogen responsive, you're increasing that patient's risk and you might want to explore a different method. Additionally, if you want to use estrogen to treat, it might just not be for contraception. It could be for, to treat menopause. Um, there's a new method of treatment modality for things like vaginal atrophy and dryness where suppositories are used to deliver estrogen only locally to the walls of the vagina so that the uterus is spared and the breast is spared and all the reproductive organs don't get that pro-growth influence of estrogen and it reduces the odds of developing um, cancer in that way. It can't address some of the systemic symptoms of menopause like hot flashes, so that's the disadvantage, but you know, it, it's, it's a trade-off. And each patient, you're going to have to have a different discussion with each patient, right? Every patient is unique and has their own goals. So anyways, because of the proliferative effect of estrogen, the endometrium is going to get thickened. If it was this thin before, it's going to get thickened so that it can actually hold the embryo and have space for it to develop. The progesterone is responsible for the secretory phase, and that's when the uterine glands are going to secrete this um, this, this mucus-like substance. It's going to get very sort of rich. Um, the blood vessels are going to change, and I don't want to go into those details right now, but the blood vessels are going to be ready to accommodate. So this prepares what? The endometrium. I'm talking about the endometrium. We're going to talk about placenta accreta in a bit, because if the endometrium is what's designed to, make, to contain the pregnancy, the myometrium is a smooth muscle that contracts during labor. The issue, the issue, if the placenta, if these trophoblasts get a little too ambitious and cross the basement of the endometrium, which is called the decidua basalis, you can get, um, not you can get, you will have what's called placenta accreta. I will talk about that more in a bit, but that's bad. That's what we call bad. But anyways, going back to the diagram. So here we have our syncytiotrophoblasts with the lacunae, the enlarged blood vessels. The syncytiotrophoblasts grow into the lacunae so that they fill with blood. You have your cytotrophoblasts here that are pushing into the syncytiotrophoblasts, starting to form the villi. Don't worry about the stuff in orange right now. Um, what I do want you to be able to visualize is that this part right here is going to connect the embryo to the trophoblasts and that's going to be called the connecting stalk it'll later become the umbilical cord but we'll see it on the next slide in more detail and don't worry about where the this orange stuff came from all right you can see here the epiblast you can see there's a one layer they sit on top of each other epiblast hypoblast this is the bilaminar disc okay this is the bilaminar disc and by the end of the second week of development, this has happened. So the second week of development, by the end of it, the hallmark is the formation of the bilaminar disc. And you can see above the bilaminar disc, part of the epiblast has generated the amniotic cavity. All right, so this is it. The amniotic cavity is hanging out over here above the epiblast. And below, you have the hypoblast, which has given rise to the primitive yolk sac. The primitive yolk sac, okay? It's not the definitive yolk sac, but the primitive yolk sac. All right? So here are our syncytiotrophoblasts, here are our cytotrophoblasts. 
and we have our amniotic cavity, our primitive yolk sac, and they correspond to what we see over here, right? Since so it's your trophoblast, cytotrophoblast, amniotic cavity, epiblast, hypoblast, yolk sac. And here we just have more of the same. You can see here, you have actual primary villi. The cytotrophoblasts have pushed into the syncytiotrophoblasts. The lacunae are even more engorged. You have more a more rich blood supply. And here you have a connecting stock. You can see that the, ex, that the chorionic plate has formed. And don't worry too much about why or how. And that there's a connecting stock. The connecting stock will become the umbilical cord. And this is important. This is important. The, chorion, the, chorion, the connecting stock is going to become the umbilical cord. And over here, we just have a histological correlate. So here's the yolk sac, right? Here's the hypoblast, and it's given rise to the yolk sac, and one layer here. You have your epiblast here, and it's sort of different. It's proliferated this way to give rise to the amniotic cavity. And here you have your primary villi. Okay, you have your primary villi. Over here, development has gone even further. So notice here, you still have your epiblast, okay? You still have your epiblast, and this is called the notochord over here, this black line, but we're going to talk more about this stuff later. The process of gastrulation has already occurred at this point, so we're focusing on the trophoblast right now. Notice how these you have these tertiary stem villi. So the syncytiotrophoblast has really pushed in past the um, past the syncytio, the cytotrophoblast has pushed past the syncytiotrophoblast at this point, and it's brought the chorionic plate with it. It like drags it with it, right? Before these orange projections weren't in here. Now they are. And within them, blood vessels are going to develop. Okay, within the chorionic, so we have the chorionic plate here, and it's going to get pulled in towards the syncytiotrophoblast and the blood supply, and capillaries are going to form inside. And you're going to see a chain of blood supply develop. So the intraembryonic vessel, eventually it's going to have vessels that are communicating with these vessels, which are communicating with the villi so that it looks like this. Here are the maternal vessels. And you have these well-formed villi that are uh, communicating. You have an outer cytotrophoblast cell now. So remember I said the cytotrophoblasts they're going to push past the syncytiotrophoblast, and they're going to keep going until they reach the decidua basalis. At that point, they're called anchoring because all they're doing is that they're anchoring the embryo. All right, they're anchoring villi. They're not these tertiary villi, they're anchoring villi. They're not these stem villi that are trying to feed, they're anchoring villi. And if they go too deep, you'll get placenta accreta, which is going to need C section and probably a hysterectomy. But that's just what I want to draw a picture to. So this is what you need to know about the trophoblast. All right. I want to talk about molar pregnancy. So let's say a woman gets pregnant, but you don't see an actual fetus. You see a mass instead. You have to be concerned. And here are some of the reasons why. When an egg does not have a nucleus, and it is fertilized. It can either be fertilized by two sperm, which will fuse together, and that's a partial hytatiform mole, or it's fertilized by one sperm that then divides and then refuses, and that's a complete hytatiform mole. That's a complete hytatiform mole okay so one sperm to so the egg has no nucleus if one sperm enters divides and then fertilizes itself it's a complete hytatiform mole if two different sperm fuse it's a partial hytatiform mole you just have to know that distinction for exam purposes but in terms of the pathophysiology um, the risk is that the hytatiform mole is going to become a growth of trophoblasts. So you have unregulated trophoblastic growth. And remember what we said about over-enthusiastic trophoblasts? They're dangerous to the mother because they will go right past the decidua basalis. So what happens is the mole 
a mole is going to grow a lot too, and you don't want to risk it being able to grow beyond where you want it to grow in Cosplacena accreta. But beyond that, the hytatiform mole also has a risk of becoming choriocarcinoma. All right, there's a risk of developing choriocarcinoma. And choriocarcinoma can occur outside of pregnancy from germ cells, but that's, that's a different type of cancer. They're called germ cell tumors, and don't even worry about that right now. Um, what I'm, but I just want to clarify, I'm referring to the choriocarcinoma that results from a hytatiform mole um, is going to cause a lot of damage. And the way you can detect this is through beta HCG. And the reason why is that trophoblasts make beta HCG. So as the all those processes that I showed you earlier of the trophoblastic differentiation and forming the villi and the gyro placental circulation in those vessels, as the trophoblasts become more and more and more in number, the more they secrete beta HCG. So we can measure the progress of a pregnancy with beta HCG. And there are nor there's a normal curve to how much it's supposed to increase. All right? There's a normal curve for how much it's supposed to increase. In choriocarcinoma, in the hytatiform mole, this number is way higher. And if it progresses to choriocarcinoma, same deal. Because you have so many trophoblasts that are secreting beta HCG. This is very high yield. They can come after you for this on testing. They will want you to understand that that highly they'll give you a question stem about a, something about an unviable pregnancy, or they might not even they might not even tell you that the pregnancy is unviable. They'll give you a whole question stem about this woman who's trying to conceive, etc. But her beta HCG is off the charts. Immediately, immediately, do not collect two hundred dollars. Do not pass go straight to complete hytatif straight not complete hytatiform mole, but one of the hytatiform moles, whether it's complete or partial. And understand that there's a risk. They might say, what is the risk in this patient? They might not ask you. So sometimes on NBME exams, they don't ask you one question. They'll ask you it in a layered way. So they'll say, if this is the if this patient has a hytatiform mole, what are they at risk for? And they won't say it's hytatiform mole. They'll give you the question sum. They'll tell you the beta HCG is way elevated. But they won't tell you that option choices won't say partial hypothyroidism, et cetera. It'll be increased risk for choriocarcinoma. That's one of the ways that they can do things. So on this slide, I want to point out something. Here we have a choriocarcinoma. You can see the disorganized trophoblastic cells. And you don't really have lacoons. You know, these you might be tempted to think these are lacoons here and here and here and here, but they're not. Um, that's just blood that's entered. These aren't actual raccoons, because this is all hemorrhage. All this red is hemorrhage, right? So that's bad. That's kind of what I wanted to highlight, how the trophoblasts can cause some serious damage when they grow too invasively. Um, in this case, it's very invasive. This is cancer. This is straight up choriocarcinoma. But uh, similar, a similar hemorrhaging situation can occur with others. And in case you can't see the hemorrhage, it's everything that's wall. I'm walling it off. Look over here. This is all hemorrhage, frank hemorrhage. All right, that brings us to placenta accreta, the hemorrhage. So here's the if we say this is the decidua basalis, this is the basement of the endometrium. Over here is the myometrium, and that's off limits. But what will happen is the trophoblast will grow, will grow into it. And when pregnancy happens, and so first of all, there's a rich blood supply here. That can get disrupted and it can cause bleeding and a failure in the pregnancy but more importantly when the placenta detaches it can cause damage because remember the part the placenta has to leave right the placenta has to leave it can't stay in the uterus so when the baby's delivered the placenta comes out after that's the aftermath so if this happens there will be a cesarean section and a hysterectomy because there isn't the risk is just so high in a subsequent pregnancy for complications um, so this isn't a good outcome but unfortunately it does happen um, and the the hemorrhaging can kill the mother if not contained properly so over here I want to point something out this is the oropharyngeal membrane, and that's the cloacal membrane. So this is the cranial side, and this is the caudal side. 
And over here, you'll see that there's the primitive node. Well, what organizes the primitive node? So you see this epiblast here and this hypoblast. At some point, this part of the, this region is going to become, this region is going to become the anterior, anterior, because it's the part in the front facing us, visceral, endoderm. And what it does is that it expresses Cerberus and Lefty, but you don't need to know that. What's important about that is that it antagonizes nodal. Nodal is what's going to establish the primitive streak. So here you have the primitive streak and the primitive node. And notice that it's forming in the caudal end, the foot end, not the cranial end. The cranial end is where the anterior visceral endoderm is. And that's going to prevent nodal signaling up here. Down there, where there isn't the effect of the anterior visceral endoderm, nodal is not interfered with, right? This inhibition does not happen, and nodal can form the primitive streak, right? Um, an important thing you need to know is that alcohol kills anterior visceral endoderm cells. So when alcohol kills these, you don't form the cranial end, the pregnancy fails. So over here, you have your primitive node which is called the organizer, and you have your primitive streak. And what's going to happen is these epiblasts are going to downregulate E. cadherin. They're going to lose their, tight, their, um, their, their, uh, their connections, and they're going to migrate down. They're going to migrate down. And they're going, some of them are going to replace cells in the hypoblast, but for the most part, they're generating a completely new layer, and that's going to be called the mesoderm. Okay, and at that point, you're going to have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. So the epiblast is contributing to all three layers. The, it contributes to the ectoderm. Some of the migrating cells are going to form mesoderm, and some of the migrating cells are going to contribute to the endoderm alongside the hypoblast. All right, and they're just falling in, right? If this is the, the cells, the cells are just like falling in, as you can see in this diagram, they're falling in. Here's a primitive node, here's a primitive streak. The cells are coming in. They're coming in. They're falling down and in, down and in. And this proceeds caudally to cranially. They're just falling in. All right? And then they're going to migrate this in this direction, laterally and cephalically. All right? So they fall in and then they move towards the cranial end and laterally. And the way they move is going to determine what kind of cells they become. But we'll talk about that more in a bit. So. As you can see here, if we were to look inside, so this is the amniotic cavity, and I cut it open, and I look inside from up top, I have the oropharyngeal membrane. The coaxial membrane isn't, visual, isn't visualized here, but it's there. This is the cut edge of the amnion. You can see the hypoblast is under. Here's your bilaminar disc. This is generating the trilaminar disc. This process is called gastrulation. What I'm talking about right now is gastrulation. All right, so this is the oropharyngeal membrane. This is going to become the oral cavity, and then the cloacal membrane becomes the anus. All right, so let's see what's going on down here with all this migration. Let's see what's going on. Over here, we have the notochord. All right, but how did the notochord form? All right, well, here's the amnion, just to orient us. Here's the wall of the yolk sac, and we have our ectoderm over here. This is the primitive pit and the neuroenteric canal. But don't worry about the phrase neuroenteric canal. What I want to point out to you is the development of the notochord here. Because the notochord is going to arrange, it's going to determine the axis on which the cells are going to migrate and things are going to form. And it's important for inducing the neural tube. This is going to make the neural tube form. So over here we have ectoderm, over here we have the notochord. Here we have our precordal mesoderm. So this is going to be, so let me draw this out over here as well, right? So if this is the ectoderm and this is our primitive pit, the notochord is growing in towards this way and the precordal mesoderm is a bit before the notochord. But we're, sorry, this is the primitive pit. This is the oropharyngeal membrane and the notochord is over, gonna be over here and the primitive pit is there. All right, here's the primitive pit. 
okay? And cells are going to migrate into the primitive pit to form the notochord. That is precordial mesoderm. All right? Now, if I rotate this, so I'm looking into it, you have this over here. You have the ectoderm and the notochordal plate. You have your mesoderm now, the intraembryonic mesoderm, right? Remember, things were coming and they were filling in. That's what this process is. This is just longitudinally, well, before we were looking at it vertically. And don't worry too much about the notochord right now. Um, but just realize that it's first you have this like developing notochord. It's like a plate. And then it becomes an actual uh, cord. And this is going to be, notice here how the ectoderm is rising. It's starting to form crests. This is important. You have to know that. It's starting to form crests, and eventually it's going to fold. Oh, the crests are going to break off and migrate. You have more crest cells. There's going to be some folding, but we're talking about that in a later uh, lecture. Over here, you have the endoderm, your endoderm, your mesoderm, and your ectoderm, and the notochord is in the middle. So this is the axis. All, the, all these layers are going to differentiate with respect to the notochord. All right? There's a concentration gradient of development signals coming from the notochord. Let's go through some questions. A G2P2 33-year-old woman receives an ultrasound after having high levels of beta HCG. No conceptus can be visualized, but a mass is seen. Analysis of the cells of the mass reveals two identical sets of non-maternal chromosomes. Which of the following is the most likely pregnancy? Take a moment to think and pause and take a moment to think about it. All right, the answer is going to be hytatiform mole. Your giveaways were a high beta HCG of a, in a woman of childbearing age with two identical sets of non-maternal chromosomes. All right, so take a minute to read this one and answer. Okay, so the last menstrual period is our baseline. That's day zero. Fertilization, ovulation occurs around day 14. The egg only lasts a few days, so fertilization has to occur around day 14. Gastrulation occurs in the third week of, pre of, uh, of embryogenesis. Of not embryogenesis, but of human development. And that's 21 days from fertilization. And by the end of the third week, that process is complete. 21. That puts us at what? Plus 20, 14 plus 21 puts us at a grand total of 35. All right. So 35 days into the, around 35 days into post-fertilization, gastrulation has occurred. So in this question stem, they're telling you her last menstrual period was 40 days ago. Which of the following events has not occurred? By now, the blastocyst has definitely implanted you have definitely generated the three primordial layers because of gastrulation. You have definitely eroded the maternal endometrial sinusoids. The diaphragm hasn't even formed yet. So this is the event that did not occur. So now that we're done talking about gastrulation, um, I just want to point out that the, the next portion of development, including some of gastrulation, weeks three to eight, are very sensitive to environmental insults. And if an insult, and remember, there's a lot of organ systems all developing at once. There's a lot going on. It's like a symphony of cell division, regulation, cell cascades, cell signaling cascades. So odds are, if you've disrupted one process, you've disrupted multiple. And that's the reasoning behind the vectoral um, associations. That stands for vertebral effects, anal atresia, cardiac defects, tracheoesophageal fistula, renal anomalies, and limb abnormalities. If you have a problem with any of these things, you need to look for others. So let's say you have a baby with spina bifida, and we'll talk more about that later. I have a baby with spina bifida. Okay, I need to check for anal atresia. I need to check for cardiac abnormalities. I need to check for tracheoesophageal fistula. I need to check to make sure the kidneys are okay. I need to check the limbs immediately. A problem with one necessitates an evaluation of the others because odds are if you screwed up one development process from an environmental insult, another one got messed up as well. All right, 
So Cartagena syndrome is an issue of the cilia, okay? So when the cilia aren't working, you have something called Cartagena syndrome. Remember, the cilia are lining the respiratory tract, and their job is to get beat and flick the junk out, right? All right, there are other places where they're involved, but defects of the cilia are going to predispose patients to respiratory infections, whether it's chronic sinusitis or respiratory bronchiectasis. Additionally, cilia are important in the process of fertility. And we're not going to belabor the point too much as to why. Okay? So you lose fertility if you have a problem, if you have a problem with the cilia. Additionally, cilia are present on the primitive node. So remember, you have the primitive node here. And the primitive node is the organizer, and it helps dictate left and right signaling. If this signaling is disrupted, you can actually get situs inversus, which means all the organs are flipped in the body. The heart's on the right side instead of the left side, for example. It's the complete mirror image. And you have problems with fertility, bronchiectasis, and chronic sinusitis. And that's the reason why I'm introducing this is, first of all, because it's related to embryology, because the primitive node has cilia, and defects in these cilia are going to cause situs inversus, because left-right signaling is going to be all messed up. Or it can cause situs inversus, not... Just because a syndrome exists doesn't mean every part of the syndrome has to be there. But it's an example of how one defect can be pleiotropic. Pleiotropy. Which means one defect has varied effects. It acts on various things. One defect, various manifestations. In this case, it's organ positioning. Uh, respiratory infections, and fertility. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out about, and that's with regards to Cartagena syndrome. The next thing I want to point out is laterality can also be disrupted by SSRIs. And that's why some SSRIs are not recommended in pregnancy. Because part of what the organizer uses to signal is 5-HT, which is serotonin. So if you're using an SSRI, you can have an overabundance of serotonin and that can interfere with laterality. And in animals, we've been able to replicate this. Um, and we have epidemiologic evidence where the incidence or the rate at which something occurs, the incidence of laterality defects is higher in mothers who, um, who were on SSRIs, like for the children of mothers who were on SSRIs. So there's evidence that SSRIs are teratogenic. So you'll, again, if now if a patient is so severely depressed and they have a history of suicide, you might not be in a rush to get them off of their SSRIs. Um, so this is just one of those things that's sort of the art of medicine. You're going to have to figure out what you're, if do you have an alternative choice, if you do, how are you going to taper it? How are you going to come back up? How do you balance, you know, this medication worked for your patient? What are the side effects of the new one? How do I balance what's good for my patient versus what's good for baby? That's the art of medicine, right? But that concludes our discussion of gas relation. I hope you enjoyed this. I know it was dense. Um, the next lectures will probably be shorter.